In 2008, a bold robbery of an armored car in Monroe made national headlines, and the man behind it became known as D.B. Tuber because of his unique getaway on an inner tube. What shocked the community even more was that the mastermind was a former local high school football star and an all-American boy next door who'd gone on to play at the University of Idaho. After serving six years in federal prison, Anthony Curcio was released in 2013. He tells his amazing story in the book Heist and High and now speaks across the country about drug abuse prevention and making positive choices. Please welcome Anthony Curcio. It's good to meet Hi. you. Yes. After reading the book, there's a real person right here there in front is. of me. Yes. Um, it's a brave book and it's unsparing. You call yourself a loser. You say you don't want this dramatic crime glamorized. Um, you took a really hard look at yourself. Well, I mean, there's not much to vouch for who I was. And uh, as much as it would be nice, I mean, there was a good person that was in a shell, you know, covered by addiction and, you know, selfish. I, I became self-centered, narcissistic. It was, everything was a, became about me. And, you know, looking back on it, I know I can't change that, but I gotta be honest with myself, hey, this is what I was. I can't do anything about that, but I can decide who I want to be today. And obviously, because of everything that I went through and experienced and being able to, to figure out what, what happened to me and why it happened, I can go out and stop others from falling in the same hole that I did. Yeah. And there's, there is redemption. There are second chances for people. There should be anyway. And it looks like you're trying to, trying to earn it. Um, the whole thing reads like a movie. I mean, you're a high school football star in Monroe. Uh, you end up at the University of Idaho, although you get injured there, just like your dad had been a star at the University of Idaho. You marry a childhood sweetheart. It looks like the picture of a life going in the right direction. But from high school forward, there were problems, and addiction was one of them. How did that start? It started with an injury. Um while I was playing football, blew out my, uh, my knee, tore my ACL, and was prescribed Vicodin. And at that time, it wasn't known like it's known now. Oxycontin wasn't known. And uh, Vicodin, you know, it's derivative of opium, which is basically heroin. And I started taking this and taking this. And pretty soon that dream of mine that I had as a kid was replaced. All I wanted to do was <laughs> sit on a couch like this and take pills. Yeah. And it just totally robbed me of who I was. And uh, eventually, you know, the prescriptions ran out, the team doctor cut me off, and I started going through withdrawals, experiencing, you know, the shakes. I mean, it was horrible. Diarrhea, sweating, you know, it becomes so bad, the suicidal thoughts come into your mind, and it just m makes you insane. So much to the point where I wanted pills so bad and no one would give them to me. I took off my shoe and my sock, went up to my coffee table, just like this one right here, and kicked it, kicked it, kicked it, and uh, all to get pills. And, uh, you know, I think I got a prescription for like 20 Vicodin. And that was. forged prescriptions, yes. were involved in, you know, criminal activity. And it, it, you sounded through this whole thing like there was a lot of self loathing in this. You hid this as best you could from your then wife, Emily, and your family. So by the time you got to the point that you were thinking of robbing an armored car, which it, I'm telling you as a mom, I wanted to reach into the book and grab you. What are you said, doing, stop you it. idiot? Stop yes. it, stop it. You got so much, you know, other, you know, other stuff out there for you. Not this. Um, at that point in your life, where you would actually contemplate a, a crime that serious, what was your life like? Um, well, on the outside, I had homes, I had cars, I had nice clothes, all the material stuff, and I was so at that point so insecure with who I was. There was no value in me. I wasn't honest. I wasn't doing good things. I wasn't staying at home, being a good dad or a husband. So my value came from external stuff, things. And that became what was most important. I had to keep this image. And so that insanity with the chemicals and all that, that was my way out. You know, and I ended up risking my life in order to keep that. How did you get the idea to rob a Brinks truck? Um, <clears throat> Brinks truck, excuse me. The economy collapsed and, you know, most of my, my money was wrapped up in homes that I couldn't sell. And, uh, you know, as my addiction progressed uh, 10 years prior, so did my involvement in crime. And just like anything, you know, you get better at what you do, and that was my next thing. And that's how I thought then. So the intricacy of this crime is important for a couple of reasons, and I'll ask you about that at the end, but let's talk about this. You spent how long monitoring 
the truck and the route and the driver and what he did? Um, probably three months, two and a half months. You figured out how you could escape across the river. First, you thought a jet ski, and you actually dug a canal or a trench in the in the creek to make sure the jet ski could get through. Correct? Yeah, that's right. And that didn't work. No. So you found another way with the inner tube. You had a disguise. What was the disguise? Uh, the disguise is when the armor car showed up on Tuesdays. That was their delivery. I would wear a landscaping outfit and a wig, and uh, you know, I just blend in. You know, blended right in there. And you had been doing some work around the bank, right, to just make it. More um, normal that you were there. Just even talking about just such an idiot. But yes, uh, every Tuesday, uh, had I invested this much time into a normal job, I think I would. That actually <laughs> is the crux of my question. Yes, yes, but, it's just but, insane. So you work um, around the bank. I mean, I, I yes. just want people to know how much effort you put into this because, it, in part, it speaks to the power of addiction and and what you can trick yourself into believing. Um, then you post an ad on Craigslist. This is kind of out of the Thomas Crown affair. Tell me about that. Uh, yeah, so I post an ad on Craigslist. Uh, after every Tuesday the armor car shows up, I'm dressed in a landscaping outfit with a wig and uh, glasses and all that stuff. And a couple uh, days prior to the crime, I post an ad on Craigslist um, looking for city cleanup workers. And, you know, of course, re people are responding. I say, okay, well, show up at the bank wearing a blue shirt blue hat, safety goggles, and a, you know, a uh, safety vest as well, which was the exact same thing are I was Are you getting wearing. this? So now, at the time he's going to commit this robbery, there are a bunch of guys all in the same outfit. So you do. You rob this armored car, pepper spray the driver, um, get away with how much money? Uh, 400000 But you dropped one bag because it was too heavy, right? Um, you know, they, I read about that, but yeah, uh, I dropped a bag. I don't know how much was in that one. but All right. So you get to your getaway point, and uh, Lord knows a bunch of things go wrong with this, but you do actually get away with this money at that point, yes. right? So the interesting thing to me about this is, yes, you put all of this effort into this, and the whole time, again, as a mom, I'm thinking, if you had just invested that much time in a proper job or a proper business, I do, just what the heck, dude, was what I was thinking. <laughs> you know, I mean... That feeling of wanting to reach into that book as, you know, m like as a mother, I want to reach back into my past and just be like, man, do you not see money is not the most important thing? You know, it's not this. It's, you know, you have it all twisted. But like I said before, there's nothing I can do to change that. And as crazy it is, I can either hide from my past or, you know, when I was in there, when I was in prison, eventually when I finally opened my eyes to, Six years, right? yeah, to who I was and quit trying to justify it, which is exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. During this time, there's always that justification um, for there's me. There's a reason this is yeah, okay. Yeah, it's like, you know, well, the banks, you know, the, they bailed out the banks, but, you know, who bailed out me? And it, there was that justification of making this right, making this okay to go after the bank's money. But... That's, that's all crazy. it is. It's just a lie that I was telling yeah. myself. Well, what's interesting also to me about this is that you were actually caught before the crime was ever uh, yes. even committed. And we're going to talk about that after the break. Uh, we'll be right back. So we are back now with Anthony Curcio, who in 2008 committed a brazen robbery of an armored car in Monroe that earned him the nickname DB Tuber for his getaway on an inner tube. Your plan seemed to go off without a hitch for several months, but it turned out that somebody actually noticed you before you even committed the crime, um, and that ended up in your, <laughs> your being captured. What happened? Um, <clears throat> prior to the robbery, I was, uh, you know, it was just another uh, day of me monitoring the armored car. I was dressed up in all my stuff, and I was going to do a time time run to see how long it would take me to do my getaway. So it was a hot day, well, as hot as it can get here, you know, and so I took off, it was on Velcro, my blue shirt, blue hat, safety vest, and I took this stuff off and I put it behind a, a dumpster. Well, um, well, stop just a second, because he had taken the time to actually make a rip-away suit of his... Um, <laughs> Yes. his gardener's outfit so that he could get away quicker. I mean, like the, the details to this thing are astonishing. Okay, go ahead. So, yeah, I uh, take off. I go do my thing. When I come back, there's this guy, um, you know, long hair, shaggedy, ragged, and uh, he's got a dog with him, and he starts mumbling something to me. Hey, I know what that is. And I say, what are you talking about? I pick it up, and I blow him off, and I leave. Well, now I'm thinking, okay, 
know, it's a homeless guy, you know, what's the chances of this guy knowing, you know, is he drunk? Is he, you know, does he, is he gonna remember who I am? And I, the problem was I invested so much time into this that I was unwilling to pull, to pull, let it go. Yeah, to let it go. But it turns out this dude works crossword puzzles. Yes. Um, he takes down the description mm -hmm. of you, your truck, and your license number, and fast forward, this leads to your capture. Tell me about being arrested. Yeah, so the homeless man gives up you know, the information. The DNA uh, connected me to the case later on. and uh, The DNA from? Uh, a mask that I was wearing. Yep. And that was ultimately with his, uh, what he saw, put me away. And, you know, I love this guy for that, for real. I mean, he saved my life. I'm lucky to be even here right now. But uh, so I'm arrested and, you know, the house of cards. Collapses. Starts, yeah. You've got a wife and two kids, right? That's right. And your parents. And I can only imagine the shame and oh, the... Oh, man. Devastation. Everything. Yeah, I mean, everyone's pretty much heard that analogy of throwing the rock in the water and the ripples. I threw a huge rock in there and just boom. I affected everybody. Uh, lying, just all of the stuff, all of the pain that I caused. And this is common with people that you know love addicts or someone that has uh, chemical dependency. They do everything for them because they're their child or they're someone that they love. But no matter what you do, no matter how bad you want to reach in there and say, come on, that person has to make that change for themselves. And I just destroyed everyone that cared that about is, me. That is such a hard lesson and it is so important. So you write about six years and now you're in prison. It's a federal crime. So you mm -hmm. are sent off to Texas and then Florida and they're not kidding around. No. Um, and you write about, you know, obviously the other people who are there being in the shoe, what we know is the hole from the movies. I'm just repeating something yeah. I've, you know, I've seen on the wire or whatever. Uh, but it was your real life where you're in a horrible place for how long? For seven months? Yeah. Covered with roaches at night and just this nightmare going on. Yeah, that, uh, that time I was, you know, thrown into solitary confinement and, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what to expect. It's just a five by seven. It's like a walk-in closet, you know, someone would have all concrete, cinder blocks, no books, you know. Sometimes you get a phone call once a month and you just sit there and you just exist. You don't get enough food to exercise even because there's not enough to sustain you. And your mind, you know, becomes your best enemy or, or sorry, your best friend or your worst enemy. And that's what it was. And at night, the lights go off at 11 and you, you just have a sheet to cover up with. And you got to make sure you're covered up because the cockroaches just come out of every little hole. And in the morning when the lights come back on at six, there's all these shadows and you just kind of freeze. And you in that panic for a little bit and you flick them all off and you go down and you just wait about a minute and then you and you get up. That was my life, and it broke me down. You know, at first I was just hating everything, hating everybody, and this rage came in me, and I just constantly, you know, shifting the blame to someone else. How could they do this? How could they do that? And how are they allowing this? And finally, after about four or five months, um, I just gave up. I just gave up, and uh, it was during that time where it was like, I finally started to get it. I finally was like, hey, Anthony, you put yourself here. You can blame everyone you want, but your choices, your decisions put you where you are today. They put your kids without a father. They put your wife without a husband. Accept it and do something about it. And that was when I decided, hey, I'm going to change who I am. It's amazing to read about in the book. And you went to church, started an AA group, wrote, drew. Um, did these different things and managed to, you know, get out in 2013 in one piece. Is your relationship intact with your wife and kids? It's the best it's ever been, yeah. Believe it or not, You I are mean, so lucky. Yo. You know how lucky you are, right? Yes, I do. I mean, there's not a day that goes by. We live in a tiny apartment. You know, it's, m money isn't like, I guess, how it sometimes used to be, but I am happy. I'm with them, you know. I know the entire Let It Go song from Frozen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can like do Like thousands of other yes. unwilling parents everywhere. Yes. Um, and you're talking to kids I, I, at universities and other places. Why was that important for you to do? Because, I mean, you didn't just slink away from this. You wrote this book that, you know, I have given you great credit, I do, for being so honest. And 
then being willing to kind of bear yourself and go to other people and say, listen, this is what can happen when you do X, Y, and Z. Why was that so important for you to do? Um, after going through all of that and everything, part of it's for me. Flat out, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like there's a purpose. It, me reaching out to help somebody gives me a purpose and gives my past a purpose. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is... I know that I can, you know, I talk to them the way I wish someone would have talked to me. Mm -hmm. I grew up during the D.A.R.E. program, the just say no thing. And, you know, they threw all this money and they had all these people, you know, the police officers trying to, you know, they were their intentions were good, but, uh, you know, it proved to be ineffective. I don't ever say, hey, don't do drugs, because that's the first thing, you know, you tell a kid, don't date him, you know, don't date him, because what, what happens, you know? It, that makes it all the more exciting. Yeah, so... Uh, that's the thing is I put my story out there. I talk about friends. I talk about the choices they make and just ultimately stop and think. And some of this stuff may make you feel great. Hey, you got a problem in your life? Take some drugs. You're going to feel great for this amount of time. And that's, that's the hook, right? And then it's got you. And it, boom. Have you gotten feedback from kids about oh, how yes. this has changed them? Um, just was it, last week, my wife and I got a stack of letters from... Uh, we were down at uh, on the way to Oregon, Thurston County de Youth Detention. You know, mm -hmm. seeing some of these kids that are in jail, you know, it just breaks my heart. They they don't have, you know, a lot of the stuff that I had, the family and all the opportunities. They're not bad kids, you know. And of course, they're just trying to feel good, and they're going to get latched on to alcohol or drugs. It makes them feel good, and that's all they're trying to do is be happy. And so, yeah, I'm in there talking to them and. You know, I was there for about an hour, and, you know, a week later, you know, I got this stack of letters, and my wife just, you know, it makes you want to cry, really. So. It looks like it's making you want to cry right now. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, just because I'm thinking that they're still there, you know. I really appreciate you being here. I think there's so much to learn from this book, and I appreciate your honesty. It was good to meet yeah, you. Yeah, excellent. I wish you all you. the best. Hey, thank you. I really do. And Emily and your kids, and please you know, tell them that I hope your future is everything you want it to be. I appreciate that. We'll link you to Anthony's website and Facebook page, and we'll tell you more about the book on our website. We'll be back in a minute.